there is a road that passes from one state into the next. It's easy to think that a border like this is a simple one, but there is nothing simple about it. Along this busy stretch of highway lies what was a battleground over the north versus the south, but not that kind of battleground which involved guns. This battleground involved years of legal disputes over where exactly this state border lies. I'm standing next to this reference marker that divides South Carolina from North Carolina. This marker in particular was installed in the year 1813. Over here is Lancaster County, South Carolina. Over here, Union County, North Carolina. And while the border here is clear, that is not always the case. South and North Carolina will change tomorrow. Some people who once had a South Carolina address will soon live in North Carolina. The Carolinas have been estimating what land belonged to who for centuries. And now that the original line's being reinforced, it's causing problems. We moved here thinking that we would live here until we die in South Carolina. In order to better understand how North Carolina and South Carolina got to this point, it's important to go back into history, all the way back to before America declared independence. In the year 1629, King Charles I of England issued a patent to Sir Robert Heath, granting him lands south of 36 degrees and north of 31 degrees. In 1663, King Charles II issued a brand new charter, establishing the province of Carolina. The province of Carolina was to be united, but that union would not last. Starting around the year 1708, the two parts began to identify themselves as North Carolina and South Carolina. Over the next two years, a political dispute ensued, leading the people to not being able to agree on a single government. In 1729, the British Crown formally split the Carolinas into North Carolina and South Carolina. In the year 1735, King George II officially issued a decree that set forth the location of the border that North Carolina and South Carolina would share but surveying the entire border would be no easy task. Two parties, one in 1735, the other in 1764, would take up the enormous task of surveying the entire Carolina border. The first party, in 1735, found themselves with low morale and battling against unforgiving terrain. Nearly 30 years later, in 1764, a new team resumed the survey without first finding the 35th parallel. This oversight was only discovered after chartering some 64 miles of land. This resulted in giving North Carolina hundreds of thousands of acres that really belonged to South Carolina. As the 1764 team continued their survey west of the modern day city of Charlotte, North Carolina, a compass altered by a magnetic anomaly led the team to draw the border a little too far north, giving South Carolina land that was supposed to belong to North Carolina. Translation, people who lived very close to the border were in for a shock. Their homes, believed to be in South Carolina, would actually be in North Carolina. This shocking reality was especially true for this convenience store. Like the homeowners in this area, this business suddenly changed from being in South Carolina to North Carolina, a state that the business had no desire to be in. Jonathan Hollifield is a civil engineer who teaches surveying at Gaston College. He offers his insight into how surveying works. Um, well, these days the technology that, that is typically used, um, it is a, uh, a station that um, instead of pulling a chain, um, they used to use what are called Gunter's chains or engineer's chains. And they were made of, uh, a lot of times they were made of standard materials. It could be nylon, but for precise measurements, they use materials called invar uh, in the tapes. And they would actually pull a tape to pull a distance. And you would have a transit that could actually turn angles and you could actually read your angles um, uh, to do your, your surveying. Of course, now we have something, um, it's called a total station. 
And instead of pulling a chain, it uses lasers. And it sends a laser uh, to what we call a prism. And that actually reflects back to the um, total station that gives you that distance. And it also has um, a digital encoder uh, that actually when you turn the instrument can read the angles, the horizontal angle, the vertical angle. It can actually make corrections. Um, if you're aimed downhill, it will make the vertical correction to give you the actual true horizontal reading uh, with the instrument. So it's very advanced uh, compared to what it used to be. Um, and for a, uh, a commercial survey to be, verif to be valid, you have to have an air, a ratio of 15,000 to one. So in other words, if you survey a distance of 15,000 feet, you have to come back to within one foot of where you began for it to be a valid survey. Gary Thompson was co-chairman of the Joint Boundary Commission. He has first-hand knowledge of how the Carolinas came together to fix this border dispute. So, you know, I'm in Gaston County here, and I understand down at the border, there were a number of, there were a number of homeowners that, that were you know, technically in South Carolina, but ended up actually being in North Carolina. So therefore they had to go through the process of getting new driver's licenses and all that stuff. So what, what remedies did North Carolina provide to, to help ease the process? So uh, we worked again together as a team with South Carolina. So once we uh, saw that these property owners were being impacted, uh, we worked together to come up with legislation to minimize that impact. Here in North Carolina, it was Senate Bill 575. Um, some things we, we, we also went out and contacted all these property owners and asked them um, how we would be impacted. So we made sure that um, we covered everything uh, or tried to cover everything. So after we contacted them, uh, we worked together to develop legislation that was pretty much mirrored in each state. Some slight differences because of difference in laws, but things like we protected uh, the property owners from back taxes. Um, we allowed uh, children that were going to school that were impacted that could continue to finish school there, uh, in-state tuition. So we looked at everything that um, legislatively that uh, was possible to try to minimize that impact. What kind of what actually started the process of saying, "Hey, you know, we need to come together and figure out where the border actually lies." Uh, what what triggered that? It was a couple things. One of the bigger um, triggers was property up in western North Carolina. So we started at the western end and worked our way to the east. Uh, there was property being sold uh, to the two states. Um, and so we needed to know where the boundary was so that uh, North Carolina would pay for its share and South Carolina would also its share. So that was the driving force in western North Carolina. Down in the east, especially in your Gaston County area, we were contacted by the uh, local governments, uh, asking for information where the county boundary or state boundary was. And really all we had was the original surveys. In that section, it was 1772. Uh, we also got calls from surveyors and engineers requesting information. So, so two things really, the Duke properties, uh, selling the property, and then just uh, uh, calls from counties and the private sector uh, wanting to know where the boundary was. Okay. Um, and, uh, you know, I have read online that changing a border would require an act of Congress. Of course, that's not what happened here. Y'all just basically clarified the border. Um, but how did you manage to avoid having to go through Congress to actually finalize this? Yeah, so um, our job was to reestablish the state boundary's original location. So part of that was to um, do research. Each section was unique because it was done in a different time period. Um, the 1815 section was actually part of a, a natural monumentation because it was a ridge line. So, um, so we looked at each section, did research, and once we completed our, our work, um, the research led to our very high confidence level that we had reestablished the bound entry original location and there was no need to go to Congress because we didn't need to change it because we had found the evidence, retraced the evidence to put it back in its original location. In the end, the commission formed the new border. The two states agreed to their findings and suddenly countless people found themselves living in a new state. It does raise a question, however, if a border existed where it has for so long and then suddenly changed by a stroke of a pen, how is that fair to people living on the border? Or are politicians seizing upon an opportunity for added tax revenues and more acres of land? 
for this border at least, it's a question that may never have a complete answer. I'm Jonathan Shannon. Thanks for watching.